Welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Celia Menchel, Chair of the club's member-led Middle East Forum, one of many member-led forums doing a variety of programming at the Commonwealth Club. The next Middle East Forum event is on Wednesday, August the 5th. It's called India, Israel, and Berkeley. Um, please go to commonwealthclub.org to find out more about this and other upcoming programs. I'd like to thank our wonderful panel and moderator for their generosity of spirit, their willingness to share their expertise and their support over the years. Thank you. And now I'll turn the program over to Jonathan Curiel, our moderator for today, who has reported from and about the Middle East in his career as a writer and journalist. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Celia, and good, good afternoon and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Jonathan Correa, and I'll be your moderator for today's program, which is called Trump in the Middle East 2020. This is the fourth annual panel we've had on Trump's policies in the Middle East, and each year we take a fresh and important look at the way the nation's 45th president is reshaping the re region. Today's program and the club's new virtual efforts are generously supported by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and a collaborative of local funders and donors. We're grateful for their support and hope others will follow their lead and support the club during these complex times in the world. We also invite everyone to visit us online at commonwealthclub.org. And a reminder to those watching on YouTube, please send any questions for the panelists during the question and answer period through the YouTube text chat. More than 200 million people live in the Middle East and what happens there, what happens in Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, and neighboring countries often has an outsized impact around the world. Donald Trump's Middle East policies have changed the region in fundamental ways, and the past year has been as tumultuous as any year under the United States as 45th president. In January alone, Trump laid out a plan for Israelis and Palestinians that was widely disparaged, but is still very much on the table. And that same month, he approved the drone killing in Iraq of Iranian Major General Qasem Soleimani, which many analysts feared would lead to a wider war in the region. Today, we have three distinguished panelists who will help us understand Trump's Middle East policies of the past year, and also understand those policies' impact. Dr. Banafshe Kenush is a scholar who's written widely about the Middle East. Eddie Simonian is a vice chair of the club's member-led Middle East Forum. And Robert Rosenthal is a longtime journalist whose career is focused frequently on international affairs. Let's begin today's program with um, Dr. Banafshe Kenush. Dr. Kenush has a PhD in international law and diplomacy and was a visiting scholar at Princeton University in 2017 and 18. She's the author of Saudi Arabia and Iran, Friends or Foes, a book that's been translated into several languages. And she's the editor of a forthcoming book, Iran's Interregional Dynamics in the Near East. In addition to her career as an independent scholar, she's been a consultant to private sector companies and international organizations, a commentator for NPR, CNN, and NBC, MSNBC, Fox News, and an interpreter for world leaders and major national international news outlets. Um, Dr. Kinush. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you, everyone who's joining us today on this program. Um, a lot of what's happening in the Middle East seems to pivot around the question of the future U.S.-Iran relations. And if I may, I'd like to uh, start talking about that and then sort of discuss a little bit how that overshadows the rest of the region, and particularly the Near East, the immediate neighbors that Iran has. Um, as of January, we have seen an escalation of uh, tensions between the United States and Iran. Uh, it began, uh, as my colleague mentioned, with the killing of the Quds Force uh, Commander Qasem Soleimani in early January in Baghdad by the United States. Um, it has been followed by a series of protests in Baghdad uh, for and against Iran, for and against the United States. And 
At the moment, because President Trump's administration is unable to bring about sufficient pressure on Iran to force it to start negotiating with Washington, this escalation is kind of getting out of hand. And by that, I mean that it seems that the prospects of U.S.-Iran relations look dimmer. Uh, and that kind of is uh, not what was intended by the Trump administration when it decided to exert a maximum pressure policy on Iran. The idea of this maximum pressure through sanctions, through the rollback, uh, the forced rollback of Iran's influence across the Middle East and Near East region was intended to bring Iran down to its knees. Now, in many respects, Iran is down on its knees at the moment, economically speaking. And since COVID-19, its budget has, uh, has gone really um, downhill. And uh, it's very difficult for the country to stand fully on its feet. But what the Trump administration is unable to see here is that in the end of the day, Iran is still a sovereign country. And it is not the Taliban. It is not um, other groups that the United States, such as the Houthis, is currently speaking with or negotiating with. These are sub-state actors with far less resources at their disposal than a country like Iran. But there is a plus side to the tensions between the United States and Iran. And the plus side is that the United States is indeed dealing with another sovereign state. And so if it begins to talk with Iran as a sovereign state and understands that Iran is limited um, to the reason of state, being a sovereign state, to not really escalate conflict to the point of no return, then that can be a point of discussion between the United States and Iran. Now, it seems that the two countries are involved in a lot of harsh rhetoric against each other. The hardliners in Iran are coming to power and they want to be harsher. But I wouldn't dismiss the idea that Iran and the United States still kind of like to toy with the idea of one day talking with each other. But my concern is that it might just stay that, uh, toying with an idea. And so what that does is generally weaken the capacity of not just the United States in negotiating with countries in the Middle East, but also Iran's ability to be a player that can be const have a constructive role in the Middle East. It also overshadows the efforts of U.S. allies in the Middle East in reaching out to Iran, countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, the United Arab Emirates, Oman, Qatar, etc., many of them do want to appease Iran, do not want uh, further tensions. Pretty much all of them do not want further tensions in the region. But they are stuck in the middle of the tensions between Iran and the United States. What Iran has done since the killing of Qasem Soleimani is be more pragmatic. It hasn't really um, done too much to respond to the killing in Iraq. It has kind of uh, had a series of setbacks because of the Trump administration's ability to force Iran to roll back some of its influence there. In countries where my colleagues will be talking about later today, Iran is trying to kind of weigh its options a little more um, prudently than before. Um, and it is also trying to buy time, really, with the Trump administration by insisting that the nuclear deal that it entered into with world powers in 2015 and from which the Trump administration withdrew in 2018 should still remain in place. And that's really fascinating because Iran really knows that the deal is, is, is dead already because of sanctions and the Trump administration's unwillingness to sit at the table and negotiate the same deal. Um, but Iran is buying time. It's buying time with its neighbors, with the United States, with the Europeans, and kind of making a pivot towards the East in order to sustain itself. So in the end of the day, Iran is not down on its knees and doesn't look like it will come down on its knees. And where we are with the Trump administration is a policy of, um, of, of, of that, that doesn't seem to work all the time. Uh, one that is of, about exerting pressure on everyone, include, including U.S. allies and including on the United States. And um, I can talk a little bit more about the individual countries surrounding Iran, uh, about Turkey, etc., and the dynamics that they each have with the United States. But I think that I'll halt here and then leave the discussion to the question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ganesh, for your, for your uh, thoughts there. Um, will be lots of questions later on. 
Uh, now, now we'll hear from Eddie Simonian, who's vice chair of the club's member-led Middle East Forum. Eddie is originally from Lebanon and earned his master's uh, degree in international relations from the University of San Francisco. His thesis was on Lebanon's factions, including Hezbollah, which has a military wing, but is also a major political party that has seats in Lebanon's parliament. Uh, welcome, Eddie. Let's let's hear from you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, listening. Uh, Lebanon, uh, I've been thinking a lot how to start this conversation, but uh, currently, as Benefshe mentioned, that Iran is going through a horrid economic situation. So is Lebanon, but Lebanon doesn't have any oil or gas to leverage. A uh, quick note that in the beginning of the year, a dollar equaled 1,500 Lebanese liras. Right now in the black market, one dollar equals 10,000 Lebanese liras. So it shows you the rate of inflation and the rate of suffering that the Lebanese uh, are going through. Uh, so the most scarce commodity in Lebanon right now is the U.S. dollar. There was a point where you could not get any dollars from Lebanese banks. You could not import dollars. Uh, right now, if you want to send dollars to Lebanon, uh, one of the most uh, common used uh, ways was Western Union. And right now, you cannot send dollars through Western Union. The only way you could do it is through banks, and it has to be fresh dollars. So if you have money in Lebanon and you have dollars in a Lebanese bank, you're not allowed to touch it. Now, this all goes back to the pressure being imposed by the U.S. government on Lebanon and on Hezbollah in particular. The U.S. government started sanctioning uh, banks in Lebanon that dealt with Hezbollah. So uh, if anybody doesn't know who Hezbollah is, they're a Shia military group in Lebanon backed by Iran. And uh, they are armed and their weapons come from Iran through Iraq, Syria to Lebanon. And they claim that uh, the justification for their weapons is Israel and freeing Palestine. The, the current situation is, is very tense. And there are two, you could say two parties in Lebanon, one that's pro-Iran and Syria and one that's pro-United States. And at the moment, the pro-Iran and Syria faction is more powerful simply because of the weapons of Hezbollah. Now, currently, there was, a, there was talk of something called the Caesar Act being passed by Congress, and that sanctions anybody dealing with the Syrian regime. And it is gravely affecting Lebanon because you have a lot of factions in Lebanon that are sending money, sending resources to Syria. And this is the biggest concern. This is one of the ways that the U.S. Uh, US government is implementing a lot of pressure on Lebanon. And it is working but it is not sparing anybody. It's affecting U.S. allies and U.S. Uh, at the same time. Um, it's, it's, again, it's, it's a tough scenario. And just looking at it uh, from the outside, not, not looking at it as a person who has family in Lebanon, it's a strategy that is a long-term strategy that is going to put a lot of damage on Hezbollah and is going to turn a lot of people against them. But at what cost is one of the scenarios? How far uh, is this uh, gonna go? Is the situation gonna go? Uh, the current, the cur there's a lot of protests going on in Lebanon. The current regime is made up of purely, purely the current prime minister and ministers is made up purely of pro Hezbollah uh, faction. So it is, it is a tough scenario. Lebanon needs a lot of money uh, right now, and uh, U U.S. the U.S. government, the EU. Nobody, uh, Arab countries, nobody's willing to give Lebanon any loans. So it is a maximum pressure, economic pressure scenario from the U.S. and its allies, specifically also not just going after Lebanon, but going after Syria, which is another part. And when we're looking at Syria as well, in my opinion, there's currently two factions in Syria, even though they're allied. It's Russian-backed. Uh, factions within the military and Iranian-backed factions within the military. And what we're seeing is uh, these two factions vying for influence. And uh, currently, Bashar al-Assad's brother, Maher al-Assad, runs uh, the, fourth, uh, the fourth division, which is closely allied with uh, Iran. And then you have members of the fifth division, which are closely allied with Russia. And you're seeing this tension of who's going to get the influence, who's going to take over the region. And the United States' influence in Syria has greatly dwindled 
to the benefit uh, of Russia uh, in that scenario. Overall, if, I, if I'm looking at the region and looking at uh, what Trump and what the administration has done, it's been a vicious economic war, especially on, on Lebanon. Uh, Hezbollah is, is sheltering their own community, is sheltering uh, their followers. They have dollars. Uh, they've been able to import dollars into Lebanon and give it to their followers. But again, the wider community and, and just to give a perspective uh, uh, to everybody about the situation. So the way Lebanon is divided, you have the Shia, you have the Sunnis and you have the Christians. Uh, to be prime minister of Lebanon, be a Sunni Muslim, to be president, you have to be a Catholic, Maronite Catholic. And to be speaker of parliament, you have to be a Shia. Now, during the civil war, uh, power was moved from the president who is Catholic to the prime minister. But the Shia Speaker of Parliament doesn't have as much influence and power. And that is something that Hezbollah is fighting for. And that is something that maybe the United States and the larger uh, uh, regional communities hope it would be a way for Hezbollah to give up their weapons, is get more institutional power as a way to give up uh, their, uh, their uh, military uh, wing. So... It's a, it's quite, it's quite a precarious situation uh, over there. If I'm, if I'm rating the way, uh, the way the Trump administration is carrying this on, I think as opposed to direct uh, military confrontation with Hezbollah, this is probably the most effective scenario that they could go after them. And it's been exasperated again by COVID. So it's one of those situations where help them in a way because the economy is truly suffering. But the question is at what cost? Because it's not just people who uh, are supporters of Hezbollah or not just Hezbollah that's suffering, it's the whole community as a whole. And, and that's the danger of how far is this gonna go? Is there gonna be a civil war? There's already tensions on the streets. There's already talk of Christians arming, Sunnis arming. How far is this gonna go? And if a civil war does arise in Lebanon, is that something that the United States, Europe and the great, greater region wants and is willing to to uh, uh to uh, to deal with Jonathan. yeah th 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 thank you thank you eddie that puts uh lebanon in in you know very, very much perspective um uh I'd, I'd like to introduce our third panelist to robert rosenthal robert is a longtime journalist whose career focused frequently on international news robert is, uh, has been a foreign correspondent in the middle east and africa editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer and managing editor of San Francisco Chronicle and also executive director of the Center for Investigative Reporting. Let's hear from Robert. Yeah, hi. Uh, well, I guess that with, in terms of uh, the Trump administration and its uh, policies regarding Israel and the Palestinians, uh, it's really been a one-way street. Uh, and depending on your politics uh, and point of view in terms of that conflict, uh, one could say if you're from an Israeli point of view, it's been basically they're getting everything they've wanted, and from the Palestinian point of view, nothing they've wanted. In fact, you know, since 2017, when the Trump administration announced that it would move the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem and recognize Jerusalem as the capital, uh, there haven't been any uh, formal or, uh, you know, contacts between the Palestinian Authority uh, and the Trump administration. So. The Trump plan uh, for the Middle East really was discussed, negotiated, created without any input. And usually uh, when that kind of thing happens, it's a non-starter. Uh, the recognition of the Golan Heights as Israeli territory was another Trump administration move uh, that was done unilaterally. And with the chaos in Syria, minimal Syrian pushback, or even from the Arab world. One of the things that I think is interesting uh, historically, those moves would have, people would have thought would have created a tremendous reaction within the Arab world, pushed back against those decisions. You know, the street was very quiet, the Arab street. And really, besides pro forma, uh, you know, complaints and con condemnations from is, uh, some of the governments, really nothing has happened. The current situation uh, obviously has been complicated and by COVID and the economic crises really almost throughout the region uh, has created, you know, a potential tinderbox. Uh, everyone's having a difficult time right now. 
the annexation plan of Netanyahu uh, got huge pushback, you know, from the Europeans. It, he was supposed to implement that, the Israelis, July 1st. It's eight days later now, and that hasn't happened. It's unclear what the formal position of the Trump administration will be uh, in either opposition or supporting it. But that could trigger things that could really spin out of control. Uh, it's unclear now whether the Netanyahu government will really do what it said and, uh, and take control or annex the Jordan Valley. Uh, what that could trigger in terms of Jordanian reaction is really unclear. Uh, I think the actions we've seen don't necessarily make problems worse. It's a continuation of really an alienation uh, of much, especially of the Palestinians in terms of any, having any kind of voice in, in their future. Uh, it's probably its worst point ever in terms of an American administration. And uh, really, it's uncharted seas here. And I think COVID and Netanyahu's own weaknesses in terms of his political situation uh, could slow things down. But I don't see any uh, thing really major shifting the dynamic except for the possibility of a new American administration. You know, the, uh, a Biden administration would have a very different uh, leverage or reaction to many of the things that Trump administration has supported. Uh, even in Congress, there is not uh, support, widespread support for the annexation plan of Netanyahu. Uh, at the same time, historically, these times of things don't lead to much uh, reaction from the uh, U.S. Congress or even an administration. But I think the next few months, especially with the election, uh, from an American point of view, I think the what's going to be happening between Israel and the Palestinians and really the mo most of the Middle East will be not really on the front burner. You know, obviously there's an opportunity or a chance things could happen that could shift the dynamic completely, one incident. Uh, but, you know, the Trump administration's view is, you know, really to retreat from that region. And, and as been, has been said, our, the American influence is really... Uh, minimized in a sense, especially with what's happened in Syria or, with, you know, our lack of leverage over the Saudis. Uh, and the fulcrum seems to be the major thing the Trump administration seems to be interested in is, is you know, how to keep punishing and isolating Iran. And that affects everything. So I'm looking forward to the questions and a good conversation. Thank you. Uh, th th thank you very much, Robert. Um, as, as you uh, indicated at the end there, so many moving pieces and so many connected pieces. And um, it's hard to separate one uh, regional conflict or one part of the regional conflict from, from another. Um, I know we'll, we'll have questions um, um, coming from uh, uh, viewers. Uh, and, um, but let, let, me, let me start with my, with my own questions. Um, uh, Robert, you, you, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the um, Trump's plan. Um, which were and noticeably absent from the White House, uh, where where was the Palestinian side, and I couldn't help but think back to um, I'm I'm old enough, um, almost 30 years ago, when the Oslo Accords brought Yasser Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin to the White House, and it was such a dynamic, um, inspiring moment that these two um, sides that have been clashing for generations were shaking hands now the, um, and coming to an agreement. Now a lot of people, in retrospect, have have. Um, seen the Oslo Accords as as kind of inefficient, uh, especially towards Palestinians. But um, tr Trump's plan, in so many ways, was was authored by Jared Kushner, uh, and is ve is very much um, a pro Israel plan. I'm wondering, I'm wondering, uh, Robert and others, if that w whether you think this plan um, has any chance in any form, or whether it's kind of dead in the water, as it were, and people are just waiting Trump out. Um, um, you know, maybe thinking he'll lose before they really get serious about um, any serious negotiations. Well, I, I, I think that everything's going to be on hold, especially, uh, you know, if you, obviously we're all, everyone's aware of what's happened in the last three, four months between the pandemic, the social unrest in this country. Uh, and I think that based on historically, when you see a president that appears to be weakened and may not be reelected, uh, how much in energy and, in you know, intensity can be put into a negotiation right now in a process that may be completely turned around and flipped 
in a period of four to six months. It, you know, it's not, uh, you know, the, a Biden administration would really come at things completely differently. And then if, and for an astute observer, this also, in terms of American politics, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, but it's possible, you know, uh, that there could be a Democratic control of the House or, and the Senate and complete shift. So that may, that I don't think people would have felt that without the, you know, momentous events in the last three or four months that have tipped everything, flipped everything upside down and sideways. So I don't see any uh, positive movement going forward. And I think even the, the hesitation or the lack of action in terms of what Netanyahu said in terms of the dead, his deadline on the annexation is obviously something's happening. Uh, and it, it, some of that may be a heightened awareness that things could dramatically shift. But Trump wins, obviously, it gives tremendous impetus to whatever the Americans want to do in terms of their and Trump's support of Netanyahu. If I may, I don't think that anybody has um, any illusions about the fact that these deals are shaky at their best, including the Trump administration. And everybody seems to be happy with just a piecemeal policy approach in the Middle East at the moment. And Benjamin Netanyahu gets the piece of the meal that he is uh, has his eyes on. President Trump his, the Iranians theirs, the Palestinians caught in between. But ultimately, my concern is that what that does is leave us with an administration in the United States and a region in the Middle East where... Um, really everybody starts kind of fending for themselves in a way. And that doesn't make anybody stronger, but everybody weaker together. So it's not just the Palestinians that are getting weak. So is Israel, so is the United States because of the sufficient lack of a broader perspective on how to fix the situation in the Middle East. Yeah, I can add a few words on this. To me, to me, it's also uh, just uh, looking at it from perspective of, of Trump. Uh, it was more of a rallying cry to get the evangelical vote as well, and that's what caught his interest. And you know, it's such, it's an election year with COVID and everything. As uh, Robert mentioned, I feel this has taken such a, a. It's no longer his priority. But if if it's a situation where he feels again that okay, I need to re-energize my evangelical base. I need to do something drastic, etc. I, I could see a big push. Uh, coming from his administration. That's the only way I see any anything drastic is if he feels it's a last effort ditch to, to energize um, his evangelical base. Well, what, what, one question we have from uh, a viewer is whether Trump's policies um, have destroyed the U.S.'s longtime role as an objective arbiter in the Middle East. And you mentioned the Oslo Accords, uh, but the, the, the questioner asks if it's, if it's even possible for the U.S. to restore itself to that kind of um, international status that it had before Trump. And I'm wondering, anyone want to jump in on that? I, I doubt very much that the United States can... Um, well, you think it could return. shift. Clearly, the U.S. in, in, in the region has been, sorry, been diminished. But, you know, bold uh, leadership. I mean, the other thing, we, we haven't used the word leadership, but the lack of leadership... Uh, globally right now in terms of really pulling together coalitions and getting people to get together and, and look for a solution uh, that may actually last and include is inclusive. It's just been absent. So the, the American pulpit, bully pulpit of the American president, I don't think uh, is gone forever, but I do think it's obviously been weakened. And uh, the truth is right now, there's so many crises globally, internally, externally that you know, will the Middle East become a front burner issue or is, uh, as uh, Eddie just said, you know, it's sort of piecemeal stumbling along uh, with sort of the status quo and, and people accepting until some gigantic crisis explodes, which forces the world's attention again to work for some solution to solve a crisis. With regard to Iran and the United States, it's very doubtful that the United States can have a lot of say about that relationship. And I think that's part of the reason why the other parties to the nuclear deal are trying to salvage what they can of the deal and the hope that perhaps a future U.S. administration will return to the deal. But, you know, we're talking about um, 
options that are more like a remote possibility rather than an immediate uh, or absolute reality. And along the way that weakens U.S. leadership in the Middle East and it weakens everybody else's policy options as well. I will say uh, personally, I, I feel looking at this, it's the one thing that has been hurt, if we're looking at it, has been the U.S.'s soft power. When we're looking at whether it's Europe and the Middle East, uh, the, the soft power, Trump has decimated that. Um, you know, we still have the military might, uh, we still have the economic uh, influence, but, uh, you know, it's not enough to conquer. You must learn how to seduce. Uh, and that's the biggest issue that we're facing right now, especially dealing with the region. Uh, could that be something that uh, will regain? Uh, I believe so, but uh, it's all going to be dependent on the steps that are going to be taken by the next administration. Uh, th thank you. Thank you for those comments. One, one, one viewer wants to know um, how Middle East countries have viewed Israel's proposed annexation of the West Bank. I know, Robert, you, you touched on that a little briefly, and I know in the last week or so, um, Israel had announced um, uh, a COVID-19 research agreement, which it described as being with the United Arab Emirates. And uh, the UAE, um, within a few minutes or hours, said, no, it's not in agreement with us. It's at the private level between researchers in Israel and researchers in the UAE. And they've pushed back on any plans for annexation. But can, can, he, can we um, just briefly mention uh, the reaction from Arab countries, um, Muslim countries, to Israel's uh, plan to annex uh, the West Bank and elsewhere? I, I could. Uh, it's I could a unilaterally talk. opposed. Uh, you know, there's no support for it. And King Abdullah, you know, has has warned that it could be catastrophic if the Israelis were to annex the Jordan Valley. And uh, you know, Jordan's a tinderbox. I mean, and with not only the refugees, all the issues there. You know, could that be the proverbial match that sets off the you know bonfire if the annexation is really pushed? That's unclear. Uh, you know, there's so many, everyone is sort of focused on their own issues. Is there leverage uh, from any of the countries uh, in the Gulf that the Israelis have tried to, you know, are talking to, or, you know, about really changing the dynamic because of the so-called alliance looking against the round? So uh, I'm not sure. I, I don't have any information and maybe others have more well, uh, up to date of, of what exactly the dynamic is, but again, this was Netanyahu announced this would happen July 1st. Clearly, it hasn't been triggered yet. Uh, but it, you know, uh, historically, some of the summers there get even hotter in the Middle East, and these kinds of things happen. To me, there's there's two uh, uh, two opinions. There's the public, what's said in public by the governments of the Gulf, and what's done in private. And when we're looking at the leadership of whether it's Saudi Arabia, uh, United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain, uh, they're more aligned with Israel than what is said in uh, in public uh, discourse. So, but but it's still a precarious situation where where you're not going to see them come out publicly and support it. But you you know from everything from what I've been reading, there's quite uh, there's strong. I don't want to say strong support, but there is support, and it has to do also with the relationship that these regions, uh, these countries have with the United States. But, but the bigger thing is more of their anti-Iran stance and uh, the enemy of my enemy uh, situation, where where they're willing to overlook certain things just to have that cover of our we have the United States and Israel on our side uh, against Iran. Yeah, I think the one thing that Israel and the United States are probably mindful of is that the fact that Iran will be recruiting a lot of sympathizers along the way as U.S. and Israeli policies uh, of annexation move forward and getting these recruits to join the so-called Iranian axis of resistance in the region. And Iran doesn't do that just in the Near East, not just with the Iranians or the Afghans or the Pakistanis, but there are Arabs who resent these annexations and have the potential of joining the axis of resistance. There are Africans who are joining in. There are Europeans who are joining in. And um, so in a way it's causing um, an irreversible rift of sorts um, in the Middle East. You know, one, one thing, you know, the, the ongoing conflict, it, it's almost like 
decades or generationally, there are in incidents or issues or things that happen that can create a, another generation of people who really oppose Israel or maybe freedom fighters, terrorists, whatever they're called. And I think we're seeing that in the last few years. That, you know, there may be a sense lack of a widespread violent reaction, but it's fueling what you know the the so-called soldiers who will continue to keep this battle going and the outrage factor. And, you know, we're seeing that happen now. And, and we're, we are in a period though, I think that the dynamic in this country politically right now uh, may slow some things down or make some things that do happen, uh, you know, very weak in terms of getting established and done, especially if there's a flip again, and from an American political point of view towards that region. Uh, thank you. I, I want to remind our audiences that this is a Commonwealth Club program called Trump in the Middle East 2020. And I'm with uh, Dr. Banafshe Kanush, Eddie Simonian, and Robert Rosenthal. I'm Jonathan Guriel, today's moderator. Um, you, you talked uh, earlier, uh, Dr. Kanush, about um, Iran's response to um, the U.S. killing of uh, uh, General Soleimani in, in Baghdad. Um, and um, a lot of analysts at the time were, were surprised at how muted the response was. Um, they, they fired missiles at um, a U.S. base. Um, a lot of a lot of the soldiers were actually hurt, uh, suffering brain brain injuries, but a lot of people were surprised at how relatively muted it was. Uh, what, one question we have from uh, viewers: What what is the end game with Iran? And I'm wondering if you could tie those those two together. Yes, of course. Thank you for the question. Um, what this demonstrated was that ideology in Iran serves pragmatism and not the reverse. Uh, and the long-term game of Iran is to stay pragmatic, uh, but definitely continue to react to the killing of Qasem Soleimani in multiple fashions and forms. Iran has already made it clear that it will widen the scope of its axis of resistance to places such as Africa, and from there launch uh, uh, an inf a policy of global influence into South America, Latin America, and into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, you just name it. And um, what, what we see is not necessarily an Iranian retreatment, but a tactical retreatment for the time being, pragmatically speaking, but also a simultaneous engagement in a war of attrition over the killing of Qasem Soleimani with the United States. So uh, long story short, Iran is not gonna forget this story. It will not forget the killing of Qasem Soleimani and it will uh, make sure in, in, in the way that it can through the combination of ideology and pragmatism to, to, to kind of contain US pressures and, and ability to deter Iran's influence and power in multiple fashions and forms. Um, I, I, want, I want to turn a little bit to Lebanon, Eddie, and this question relates relates to you. Um, uh, Saad Hariri the, the, uh, was, was uh, forced essentially to step down, um, but he was in the news about a year ago when he seemed to be kidnapped in, in Saudi Arabia and um, issued a, a kind of an odd pronouncement and then was freed a couple days later and then went back to Lebanon. But, but it was a reminder in a way of the deep nexus that exists between countries um, where you talked about diplomacy and behind the scenes. This was definitely behind the scenes that became public. I'm wondering if you, if you could just talk about Lebanon and its connection to Saudi Arabia and maybe its connection to Trump in that sense is kind of, you know, tr tr odd triad, as it were. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I want to first take a broader look at this and just uh, explain something. So when you're looking at Lebanon, you're, you're looking at at communities that are more loyal to whether it's their religion or backers than their own country, in a sense. So let's just look at this. Le uh, the Shia in Lebanon are backed by Iran, influenced by Iranian pressure. The Sunnis in Lebanon are backed by Saudi Arabia and influenced by Saudi pressure. And then when you're looking at the Christians in Lebanon, historically they were backed by French. And, uh, you know, the Christians in Lebanon call French their sensitive mother. So, so it, it's when you look at the communities, you're looking at these factions, and that's looking at the, the problem of, of Lebanon to start with. You know, when uh, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, how Lebanon was created, you had Mount Lebanon and then Greater Lebanon. 
And and that that goes to a the Sunni community as well. And it's a lot of influence from Saudi Arabia, whether it's financial backing and uh, and uh, support. So typically, when you're looking at Lebanon, uh, except this last one, typically they're all backed by the Saudi Kingdom. So they'll have the influence and money from from Saudi Arabia, and that's specifically, especially with Saad al Hariri. That was, you know, his father was uh, was backed by Saudi Arabia. Saad al Hariri has Saudi citizenship, so he's not only a Lebanese citizen, but he's also a Saudi citizen. His wife and children uh, uh, live in uh, Saudi Arabia. His wife is a uh, is Saudi. So, so there's a lot of uh, connection over there. He was extremely close to King Abdullah, Saudi Arabia. The situation with what happened with him and how he was uh, forced to resign. A lot of a lot of hearsay on what exactly happened, but what what it was was the Saudis were extremely disappointed in his stance against Hezbollah and his soft stance against him. He wasn't taking a hard enough stance against Hezbollah, and they pressured him to to resign, uh, trying to get his brother Baha al Hariri to come in and become prime minister, but that was. Uh, that was halted, and the Lebanese president uh, refused to accept Hadid's resignation. And it took uh, President uh, Emmanuel Macron of uh, France to come to Saudi Arabia to personally uh, uh, get uh, Saad al-Hadid back to Lebanon. So again, it, it, it's not just the Sunni community; it's uh, all the communities in Lebanon have outside backers, have international backers, and that goes to the core of the issue and the problem with Lebanon of uh, you know, your loyalty, is it to the country? Is it to your religion? Is it to a foreign country? And again, it goes back to the creation of Lebanon of different communities, different ideologies being put together just on a map, drawing something on a map uh, during, uh, through sex. Thank, 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 thank you, Betty. Um, I, I want to return uh, to Israel because we, ha we have several questions about that. And um, uh, I know. I know when when uh, Trump moved the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem, that that was, uh, you know, rightfully so, garnered a lot of headlines and debate um, about the symbolism and the practicality. Um, one one question is whether uh, moving uh, the embassy to Jerusalem was was quote unquote payback to donors, evangelical Christians, and others. Um, and then um, an another question, sort of related, is at what point does unconditional U.S. support for Israel stop? Um, why does it continue? Um, these are these are all questions I think um, that have that been even been raised in the U.S. presidential, um, uh, you know, um, primaries or run up to the primaries so far. Can can you know? But how about if you address one of these issues, all of them? Anyone want to take a chance? Well, I'll start, and everybody should jump in, please. Uh, you know, Trump promised campaign saying he would do that, and was it payback? Uh, well, his, one of his biggest donors was sitting there, Sheldon Adelson, uh, when they had the ceremony, uh, you could argue that that was payback and he said he would do it and, you know, he did it. And without really any, uh, you know, concern, it seemed about potential consequences, uh. And it's, you know, as a businessman and what we've seen, obviously, with the president, you know, he, he tends to uh, make decisions and bully people in decisions and see without thought of the consequences frequently. And in this case, there were great warnings about the potential consequences and the violence. And clearly the American, this administration didn't care uh, about that. The historic uh, connection or support for Israel obviously came out of you know, the creation of the state of Israel and we know the history in World War II. Uh, it, you know, there even have been Republican administrations who have, you know, pressured these Israelis, especially in terms of the settlements and things like that. Uh, and I think that, you know, a new generation of politicians going ahead, you may see some of that support wane. Uh, clearly it's a very complicated mix uh, the evangelicals come, their support is based on, you know, if you understand their thinking, uh, we need a Jewish state so it can, in a sense, be destroyed. <laughs> so that, you know, it creates uh, the end of the times. 
So it's so I, I personally don't see that changing dramatically, but I do think uh, clearly a new administration would pressure uh, an Israeli government and be if it you know the question earlier does the U.S. want to really have influence in the region? To do that, you have to have some credibility with the Arab world uh, and in a different way, simply not, I believe, based on uh, business relationships. And that pretty much has evaporated, uh, except as, as Eddie talked about, you know, the, the relationships based on, you know, the alliance against Iranian threat. Um, it's really complicated, but I, I think you will see it with the Biden administration, uh, you know, a, a change uh, in language and rhetoric and the relationship with Israel. My concern in general, not just with the Trump administration, but many <coughs> administrations, and uh, Robert can correct me if I'm wrong, is that, you know, um, they come into office trying to create a legacy. It's sort of a legacy building culture. Uh, whereas dealing with the Middle East, you have to get used to getting your hands dirty and dealing with every little tiny detail. And rather than helping Israel build up walls that are stronger for Israel alone, but isolated um, to sort of allow a permeability of policies within the Middle East and watch, and watch Israel grow as part of the Middle East rather than as this big wall within the Middle East. And as long as we fail to do that, I doubt very much that even a Biden administration would be able to sort of alter this uh, legacy ten building tendency in, in American administrations, uh, unless it's, it's really, again, willing to be more humble and go into the Middle East and deal with multiple actors. I, I think that the current administration is actually going to be the most pro-Israel administration that we've seen and we're going to, well, now we've seen there, there's been, but that we're, we're going to see for a while. The narrative is changing in the U.S., and especially when you're, locked, you're talking about uh, the new generation, college generation, you're seeing laws trying to be passed where they're tying uh, military aid to annexation, et cetera. So, so there is a change of narrative. It's not going to happen overnight. It's a long road, but, but it's going to the country isn't as pro-Israel as it was before, uh, and I feel that's the change that's going to happen now with the embassy move uh it was the trump administration got nothing for it that's the problem if if they did it and they got some sort of uh, uh promise from netanyahu some sort of give and take then that would have been one thing but they got nothing it was just like it was just trump uh a giveaway to his donors you could say and uh trump assuming from jared kushner but the way I do look at it is that in the long run, the narrative is changing, and that's going to help uh, uh, the Palestinians uh, in the Middle East. Uh, th th thank, you, thank you, Eddie. One, um, let me, you know, one interesting thing happened in recent months uh, on the, uh, when the Chinese wanted to go into Israel and help build, I think it was a desalinization plant with a huge investment in Pompeii. Uh, you know, he flew to Israel, and basically the deal got nixed. I'm not sure that if that kind of narrow focus for Israel is sustainable, uh, especially on an issue related to water, <laughs> which is so crucial. So, you know, that's, again, the American influence, which certainly in the long run was not, I think, in Israel's interests. I mean, and, and again, water. Uh, and basically, this administration said, no, 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 no. So, uh, and that's, and, you know, if I was in Israeli politics, that would be something I would be paying attention to or an Israeli citizen. Is that good for Israel? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a very good point, Robert. Um, uh, one, one question um, that has come up and, and um, this, this relates to Yemen and Saudi Arabia. I know there are so many issues we can go over, but, um, and one, one issue that Trump and I went over, I, I want to say a year or two ago, um, was the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, um, and it was such a horrific um, uh, crime. And after it happened, um, the Trump administration had basically said, "Well, commerce is more important than this person's death." Essentially, and it created an outrage. And then, it, you know, we went on to other things. But um, Yemen takes us right back into that because the Trump administration has talked about arms sales to Saudi Arabia and how important that is. And um, you know, U.S. weapons have been found in Yemen. Um, 
um, which is, you know, that's a country that has led to killings, thousands of killings of innocent civilians. Can you talk about um, the connection between Yemen, Saudi, and Trump, or any any part of that relationship? If, if I may, the Trump administration came into office of holding some of the legacy of the Obama administration regarding Yemen in that the United States had decided under President Obama that any involvement in Yemen would not be to be directly involved in an armed conflict with the warring Yemenese parties, but simply to assist Saudi Arabia to fight terrorists. Now, Yemen being a blurry um, civil, political, and military battlefront, you know, lines can get a little confused over there. And... Um, what I believe President Trump is faced with is this uh, issue that it, while the United States is unwilling to go into Yemen and fight a war for anybody over there, let alone for itself, that it's not the U.S. war to win or lose, it can't leave the Saudis entirely alone in fighting that war either because then what would be the next best alternative? Uh, the next best alternative would be a new Yemen, uh, possibly a more divided Yemen, and Yemen in which Iran will have even more uh, access to than it does already. And um, so I think we, the Trump administration is somewhat stuck in there. They've tried, in, in all fairness, to speak with the Houthis in the past two years. They've started negotiations in earnest with the Houthis. They keep, the negotiations keep breaking down because it's really a larger symptom of where the U.S. and Iran are going to go on issues in the Middle East. And as long as that problem is not resolved, I don't believe that the Houthis will completely abandon siding with Iran in favor of making a deal with uh, Saudi Arabia or the United States. Uh, th th thank you, uh, Dr. Kinnish. Um, it's, it seems like every day in my newsfeed I get an update, uh, on, uh, uh, not, on, not only on the Middle East, but Israel, and not only on Israel, but Netanyahu. And um, it was sort of surreal to see the White House ceremony with the peace plan um, at the same time that Netanyahu was under indictment for alleged um, um, corruption. Um, and so one question we have from an audience member is, is how the panel sees the future of Netanyahu. I know he's in a, um, a, a government with Benny Gantz, a kind of a share government uh, where Benny Gantz is kind of in a, I forget his title, but he'll be prime minister uh, next year. But how do you see the future of Netanyahu and maybe how that, and what does that say about maybe the Trump administration's plan? Well, he's been on shaky ground for a long time and survived. Uh, you know, that one of the total wild cards, the same thing in globally is COVID. You know, the re Israeli response, you know, they're retreating, you know, there's tremendous acrimony there over what ha what's been happening. And there obviously isn't unanimity. I, mean, I can't predict. Netanyahu survived. But if there's a new administration, they will, he will not have the same relationship uh with the president biden that he's had with trump and uh you know they're trump and netanyahu have been sort of joined at the hip uh though when Net there was a sense that netanyahu might go down obviously trump sort of called him a loser uh which was typical but i i think predicting what's going to happen to netanyahu is pretty much impossible and israeli politics are so arcane and mercurial uh you know the system they have uh and cobbling together coalitions. Uh, but, I, you know, again, I think that uh, uh, there will be change, which way it goes either way after the American election. You may see a real uh, entrenched Netanyahu was stronger with the Trump administration coming back for a second term. Uh, there'll be nothing to hold anything back. And if a Biden administration with a Democratic support in Congress comes in, there will be changes. You know, how effective they'll be, who knows? Prime Minister Netanyahu has been savvy in uh, leading Israel's foreign policy to an extent because if we look at the case of Syria, the case of Iran, you know, he's, he, he does engage in hitting Iranian installations in, in Syria, but he doesn't take the battle full on. He doesn't engage full on. And he works with the Chinese a little bit, talks with them, talks with the Russians, certainly, um, to, to kind of find modalities to coexist in the region with the reality of Iran and Hezbollah being around, you know, Israel's neck, so to say. Um, so I think he's been, he's, he, he, he does deserve some credit 
uh, in the in to the extent that he's trying to be pragmatic with what Israel can realistically achieve. Israel cannot realistically get into a full-on battle with its enemies in, in the Middle East. And the Russians can't fight that battle for Israel either. So under Prime Minister Netanyahu, interestingly, this hardliner prime minister, we see uh, a degree of pragmatism in the evolution of Israel's regional foreign policy, I would argue. Well, I, I'd love to know how you think why Israel's covert strikes, apparently covert strikes in what you might call surgical operations not only in Syria, but who knows who created the explosions in near Tehran in the last few weeks, how they keep getting away with that in a sense. Yeah, they they are strong. They and they have done a lot with the Trump administration to contain Iranian power. Um, so they're good at what they do in in terms of the covert operations, but uh, it's it's still different from a full on war. So I, I think when it when it comes to Netanyahu, if he keeps having opponents like Benny Gantz, uh, he's he's gonna he's gonna be uh, successful because. Talk about shooting yourself uh, in the leg. Uh, Gantz, prime minister of a minority government, uh, but it was it was too much for some of his coalition members just to get the vote of Arab parties. Not even to have him in government with you, but that was that was a line they wouldn't cross. So, and that shows you just uh, as Robert mentioned, just uh, the complexity of the electoral system in Israel, in essence, where certain extreme parties on each side could control uh, the victor. And you're talking about governments that one, two, five extra MPs could uh, create a create a government. And just a, a note about Netanyahu, uh, him and Trump uh, have the very similar playbook. Uh, in, in his last in the last election, the vitriol, the hatred, the racism that came out of his mouth is very similar to the way uh, Trump right now is leading this election of the other, the other, the hatred, they're doing this, they're the enemy. Same thing with how Netanyahu uh, spoke about the Arabs, they're the enemy, they're the enemy. Uh, oh, Gantz is, uh, is allying with terrorists, etc. So, so you have that. Uh, that mentality that they both share. Um, is he is he going to survive again? You know, uh, that's that's a tough one. Uh, is there going to be someone within within the Likud, Likud party coming in and taking over? I think that's the most likely scenario. He's a uh, he might he might have to come take over. As for Gantz, he's a co prime minister. Uh, I don't know the exact title, but it's like some some weird title. I don't see him becoming prime minister in eighteen months. I just don't see. The right-wing uh, members of Likud giving him the premiership, and I could definitely see Netanyahu usurping power if he doesn't uh, get charged uh, with uh, with any crime and uh, well, not charged, but if he doesn't get uh, found guilty of uh, any crime. Uh, th thank you. I, I want to remind our audiences that this is a Commonwealth Club program called Trump in the Middle East 2020. Uh, we're speaking with Dr. Banafshe Kanush, Eddie Simoni, and Robert Rosenthal. I'm Jonathan Gurriel, today's moderator. Um, we, ha we are coming sort of to the end, and, and maybe this is an appropriate question um, um, to ask. Um, if Trump loses the election and Biden wins, w will a new policy uh, be better under a Biden administration? Or what do you, what do you see, if, if, I can, if, I, if, I can go out, if you can go out on a limb here, what do you see changing under a Biden administration? I know you've, you've hinted at this a little bit in, in your um, comments uh, in this panel, but I'd, I'd like to hear them again, if you will. Me? Uh, yeah, sure, Robert. I'll start, I guess. I, you know, I, I think, well, for one thing, uh, Biden might be able to get, or at least begin conversations with the Palestinians. I mean, they've been, you know, excluded. Now, whether that leads to something real positive happening, I'm not going to, who knows? But you're not going to get any kind of resolution that's involving the two parties unless they're at the table together, or at least having an interlocutor. And right now that doesn't exist. Uh, I don't think, you know, in terms of the wider Middle East, uh, I, you know, there may be an attempt to create some kind of dialogue with Iran, whether Iranians would do that. I, you know, have no idea. I mean, the Russian influence and in the, the, you know, the field has changed since Biden was in the White House. I mean, the war in Syria, the Russian influence is clearly expanded in the region. We haven't talked a lot today about Turkey. 
uh, what they've been doing, what's happening in Libya, the Egyptians and the Turks, the Russians in Libya. So a lot of the elements have changed a lot. But I, I do think the biggest change, if there's a Biden uh, administration from an Israeli-Palestinian point of view, well, they'll begin a dialogue with the Palestinians. Whether they can bring them to the table with the Israelis really remains to be seen. I think, you know, uh, Biden has a lot of advisors who were part of the nuclear negotiations, negotiating team under the Obama administration with Iran. So it is uh, conceivable that they will try to salvage that deal to an extent. But as uh, Robert was saying, it's not clear to what extent the Iranians will be on board because and it's, this is not just an issue about Iran. It's the larger issue about the impact of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East and that it has over the years, and especially under the Trump administration, encouraged individual actors, individual countries in the Middle East to kind of go their own way. Even the allies are going their own way. Um, and so I would say that a Biden administration's biggest uh, task would be to kind of figure out how to encourage everybody to come the U.S. way again. And it's very doubtful that that will happen. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Vinesh. I think, I think that's the biggest thing is trying to corral everybody to have that influence again. And as I mentioned before, I think it comes down to soft power. But what, what I do think is the, the lowest hanging fruit, which Robert spoke about, is engaging with the Palestinians. I think that's the one thing that at least they could say that they tried to do something with the Israeli situation as opposed to Trump is that to engage with the Palestinians and have a conversation with them. So. That, in essence, that's uh, that's the easiest one. As for Iran and Syria, it's it's a complex situation, and uh, it, it it's you know it, it's something that even so, some of the policies. I just hope that some of the policies that Obama had aren't going to be continued in the Biden administration. It needs to be a mix of sanctions and uh, Obama policies. But again, the 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 clearest thing is that, as Robert mentioned, they will engage, I think, with the Palestinians. I, I, I want to get in, um, I think we have time for one more question, possibly two, but I want to get in one question and then do uh, kind of go off on a tangent. Um, when, in my reporting from the Middle East, I've, I've been to most countries in the Middle East, uh, and I've been to Iran, and um, I reported on the Jewish community there. It's, it's really fascinating part of the community. It's been there for, you know, generations and generations. And, you know, knowing about this community changes your perspective. Um, on, on the region. One question we had, uh, uh, a viewer points out that, um, yeah, the Jewish community in the Middle East, the long, largest one exists in Iran. They have members in government, um, which is true, and they are proud of being Persians. Uh, that, that is true. They've told, told me that. But I, I want to ask each of you, um, is there an X, do you see an X factor in um, people's impressions of the Middle East and Donald Trump? Or um, what, what do you see as kind of maybe... Um, you know, the, the biggest X factor in the next going forward, say, in the next five, six months. Um, um, who, wants, who wants to start? I'll throw in something that we, the pandemic. Uh, it's affected the entire world. It's obviously uh, shown the necessity of trying to work together for global solution. Uh, this economic disruption everywhere. There's inequities that have been highlighted uh, that we know about, but even highlighted more by the pandemic and look who's dying and the socioeconomics around that. So that may actually be something that uh, is catalytic in terms of really having leaders, if they emerge, uh, really think differently and actually potentially not push to more isolation, but global solutions around certain things uh, that are now backburnered everything from the environment to economics to human rights issues. So I think that could be an X factor. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a global a crystal ball, you know, global ball to predict the future exactly. But I would say just living in the United States, being part of this community and culture, that over the years, I've seen a drastic shift of perception about the Middle East and what you know, the United States was when I, uh, you know, 20 years ago. And uh, now that we are as a nation going through a lot of self-reflection, you know, with the Black Lives Matter, et cetera, if we have so much, you know, misunderstanding about our own community, I think it's inevitable that we will realize that we have a great deal of misunderstanding about the Middle East and the individual countries over there, including Iran. You mentioned the issue of the Jewish community in Iran. I'm, I'm glad I don't usually talk about my private life, but I'm a 
Muslim raising a Jewish household. And, and I come from the Middle East. And these are stories that don't usually come out as much in the political discussions we have about, you know, Jews in the Middle East versus the Iranians, Israel versus Iran. And, and so I think these debates will inevitably have to get highlighted more and more. Uh, talking about X Factor, I think the one thing that is still kind of uh, a bit precarious, and I'd be very interested to see what happens, is the succession in Saudi Arabia. What will happen uh, when uh, the current king passes away and what the situation is going to be? Is it going to be during Biden's time or is it going to be during Trump's time? Because I feel, I truly believe that there, there will be two different scenarios depending which administration uh, is in power. Uh, that, that's the biggest X factor, I, I truly believe, for that region, which will, will have ramifications uh, all over. W one thing about Trump, uh, I do want to say, and just going off uh, off the conversation a bit, is that I think he's more popular than people tend to assume in the Middle East. And, and that has to do with the sense of the other, uh, the sense of hatred towards other communities, which, which is, is common everywhere. But for example, a large portion of the Christian community in Lebanon does support him. And you see uh, large portions of populations that are anti-Iran do support him. So, so there's these nuances over there that we don't really talk about. And we just put the Middle East as one big box and, oh, everybody's this, everybody's there. But it is as divided, as Benefsha mentioned, as as the communities in, in the United States. And if I just may add one other thing in um, about Saudi Arabia, a country that I've worked on. Um, since the Pashori murder, um, obviously the, the opinion about Saudi Arabia has been in, very negative. But uh, I think that at some point the United States will come to the awareness that Saudi Arabia is not the sum total of that killing, uh, that horrendous killing. And if you go to Saudi Arabia, uh, you do see a lot of people over there as well, wanting change, wanting more of life than what they were used to receiving. Um, and um, those shifts are inevitable, whether uh, the crown prince stays in power or not, he has initiated uh, a, a new beginning for Saudi Arabia for good or bad that will take that place to, to new horizons as well that we as Americans are not yet thinking very clearly about. I'm going to do my moderator's role and sneak in one final question because I think I can. I think we have maybe a couple more minutes. Um, this came across my newsfeed a couple of days ago. It's from the Daily Beast, and it talked about um, a propaganda campaign um, by these um, avatars, essentially made made up people who were pushing um, theories about um, uh, uh, about Iran and and uh, uh, um, the UAE and others, uh, Qatar. And basically assigning blame, and and it was a kind of the kind of propaganda campaign uh, that the Russians implemented in 2016 for our election. Um, so let, let me ask this: This program tries to go right down the middle and tell you know viewers and and listeners who will be listening to this, here's what we think is going on, and let's have a perspective from a multiple angles. Um, but we live in a society where a lot of people just get one perspective, and that and they're good with that. Um, maybe even the, this American president. Um, I'm wondering how you think um, that is influencing people's perception of the Middle East and actually policies in the Middle East. In other words, this, what I would argue, misperception, a kind of narrow-minded view that's not based on facts, but is based on kind of um, emotions and maybe um, you know, uh, uh, feelings, awkward feelings. Can you, can you talk about that as our final question? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, if I, if I may start, I, I would say that, you know, as popular as, uh, you know, the idea of avatar and multidimensional, you know, perspectives on nuanced political issues is emerging and, and fascinating people, on, especially on social media. I wish as Americans that we were also more multidimensional in our in trying to understand the rest of the world. I still find ourselves being increasingly unidimensional at times. And we're only forced to break away from that when we really, when things start falling on our, on our heads. Uh, and um, just take the example of the UAE, Iran, Qatar, you know, Within the Gulf region, there is there is a UAE Saudi Bahrain axis. 
there is a Qatari, somewhat Oman, Kuwait in the back, and Iran axis, and neither of them are full-blown axes. And, and within that, people are talking with each other. The UAE and the Emiratis and the Iranians are somewhat talking, you know. And, and so there are so many different shades of gray for us as Americans to, to grasp. And, uh, and I hope we do that in a multidimensional fashion. And I don't know if that kind of even barely touches on what you were trying to, uh, the debate you were trying to encourage here or not, but I hope it does. Thank yeah, you. I'm not, yes. Jonathan, I'm not sure your question, but, you know, quality, what I call quality information from multiple sources is crucial and the ability, obviously, to distort information or misinformation or propaganda it, it, because of the way social media works, it, you know, is a game changer. But one thing I also want to just say is that the, the lack of reporting on the ground throughout the region it's appalling in terms of an American audience. Uh, I, I, we could go through a litany of countries, regions, issues, uh, and I follow the Middle East pretty closely, but the lack of stories from the ground, uh, just take the refugee situation throughout the region. Uh, you know, how little do we really know about what's happening? And there's so many refugees now. What's really happening in Syri Syria and Kurdistan in the ISIS camps? So, uh, you know, that also to me is a huge problem and it's a historic problem. The Middle East is so complicated and, and honestly, I think most Americans really don't understand it at all. Yeah, my, my concern, Jonathan, isn't that, that Americans aren't getting information from multiple sources. My current concern is that appointed officials in, in the administration are not getting information from multiple sources and they stick to one source. And that's actually one of the problems that we're facing is that they get their information from one, let's say, right-wing source. That's their whole worldview is from that, and they base all policies off of that, not understanding the nuances of the situation on the ground. And, and that's hard for me. You know, you can't change the habit of people easily for the American public to want to get more information. It starts, you know, it starts, I think, with education. Uh, it, it goes all the way back to schooling, education, et cetera. But yeah, the, the, the scary part, and I hope it changes with the next, well, I'm sure it will change with the next administration, is actually looking at multiple sources, looking at multiple information, understanding the region better when making decisions. Uh, th th thank you. I pre appreciate all your comments. I want to thank uh, our distinguished panel again, Dr. Banafshe Kanush, Eddie Simonian, and Robert Rosenthal for their um, great presentations today. We want to also thank our audiences uh, who are watching for your questions and for watching. And we also want to thank those listening to the recording, um, uh, the recorded uh, podcast uh, and on the internet. I'm Jonathan Curiel. I've been your moderator for today's fourth annual Trump in the Middle East program. Uh, thank you for watching and listening. And if you're listening to the recorded version, thank you for, um, for listening to us over the years. Uh, Commonwealth Club is celebrating over 116 years of enlightened discussion. Thank, thank you. Thank you.